Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today on this vital topic for Colorado. I'm Debbie Brown, the president of Colorado Business Roundtable, and we're joined with some very uh, wonderful guests to talk about the importance of higher education in particular right now and all the changes, challenges, and opportunities that come with this back to school season. The Colorado Business Roundtable is a public policy organization comprised of executives from some of the state's largest employers. And we work together with elected leaders, business and nonprofit leaders, and other strategic allies to strengthen Colorado's economy. We work in all four corners of the state and we're unapologetic about uh, the voice of business and how business is a good, um, a good force for good for Colorado. Uh, the importance of today's conversation um, in particular, uh, we all understand uh, the shift this time of year brings, either as a student, an educator, or perhaps a parent. It's back to school season. As summer winds down, there is a great anticipation and preparation for the start of the school year including school supplies, a fresh haircut, uh, making sure summer reading is completed. Perhaps if you're a college student, it means a new laptop, um, a new dorm room, and of course, uh, we're hoping football season. As the mom of three adultish kids, I've experienced these natural rhythms preparing for a new school year to start. And the college experience is always new and exciting and hopeful. And these students are really gonna change the world and we're counting on it. But inter COVID-19 and the 2020 back to school season is very unrecognizable. We can all agree we're in uncharted territory and that the territory keeps moving. Every aspect of our lives has been touched by COVID-19 and the pandemic has forced us to look at new ways of doing things in every industry and higher education is not exempt from that new challenge. As our culture and society rely heavily on access to and obtaining an education, many questions need to be addressed. And as a community, it's our responsibility to come together to collaborate on the best ways to successfully manage the many changes required for today, as well as how to anticipate the ramifications in the future. And we know that the ultimate success of business and higher education are strategically linked. For business to thrive, we must have a pipeline of smart educated workforce and our Colorado institutions of higher education must be adequately funded to meet these future needs. So today we're gonna to dive into this kind of a conversation. Um, I look forward to uh, the conversation with our distinguished guests who are presidents um, that, that represent a combined 100,000 students, thousands of employees and billions of dollars in budgets. And I wanna thank our sponsors, American Council of Engineering Companies uh, known as ACEC, Lockheed Martin, AT&T, Centura Health and Manufacturers Edge for being a part of today's event. So I thought it would be fun before we introduce uh, the presidents of the organization, we're gonna have a short um, introduction from two panelists, but I wanted to show off my, uh, my cool hats getting ready for the school year. I've got support for <laughs> MSU, uh, Metropolitan State University of Denver, I've got my CSU water mug to show support for CSU. And I've also got my CU hat for when I go to the Buffs game. So excited to welcome all the university presidents today. So we'll do full introductions for the university presidents after we set the stage with two important presentations. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce Kristen Strom. She is the leading voice for free enterprise and economic opportunity in Colorado with a career spanning small business, public policy and philanthropy. She is the current president and CEO and was one of the original founders of the Common Sense Institute, a nonpartisan research organization dedicated to the protection and promotion of Colorado's economy. Following Kristen's presentation, I wanna welcome Scott Wasserman. He's the president of the Bell Policy Center Scott and his team play a major role in fiscal reform, education policy, economic security, and other issues affecting Coloradans. Since 2000, the Bell Policy Center has worked to advance economic mobility in Colorado. So welcome to this exciting conversation, and I welcome folks attending. If you have questions towards the end, we're going to look to you to put them in that Q&A box in the Zoom webinar, and we're looking forward to a really candid conversation. So first, Kristen, take it away. Thanks so much, Debbie. 
and we have a fancy PowerPoint to start the day, really appreciate Colorado Business Roundtable for hosting this important discussion today. I wanna to start off by saying something pretty profound. COVID stinks. It would be so much more fun to be in person with you all today. At Common Sense Institute, it's our mission to research and examine the big public policy issues facing our great state and their fiscal impacts on jobs and the economy. An important component of our state's economic success, as we all know, is a well-functioning higher ed system that provides opportunity for all. And you can go to the next slide. Not every kid in our state should or, oh, go, yeah. <laughs> should or will go to college, but every person in this great state should have that option. It's a topic that's really near and dear to my heart, not just in my day job. I also serve on the board of trustees at my alma mater, Coe College in Iowa. Coe is a small liberal arts college whose mission is built around preparing students for fulfilling careers in a diverse, interconnected world. As is the case with Coe or every other university in our country, these are incredibly challenging times. Our board meetings over the last couple of months at Coe have felt like a bad reality show. Bad news on top of bad news. In Colorado, the challenges are equally as fierce, but I wanna start with some good news. Colorado is fortunate to have a diverse and effective blend of higher learning options. You'll hear from leaders of three institutions that are a vital part of Colorado's ecosystem later today. Good news for students. If you wanna to go to a vocational school or a four-year university, in Colorado, there are world-class options. But that's just the beginning of the conversation. Next slide. Today, Colorado ranks third in the nation in workforce needs with 74% of all jobs requiring some form of post-secondary education. Unfortunately, right now, as many of the employers know on the call, having, we're having to import talent to meet our state's needs. To meet the workforce demands, that would mean we need an additional 6,200 Colorado K-12 graduates to obtain some form of post-secondary education. We need more Colorado high school graduates to attend college. We've got to do better. Next. Colorado has a rich and diverse economy. We all know it's an expensive place to live and raise a family. According to the US News and World Report, Colorado is now the eighth most expensive state to live in the nation. And earning a livable wage increasingly requires some form of post-secondary education. As seen on this chart, not only do three out of every four jobs in Colorado require some form of education beyond high school. But the tier one jobs, those defined as making over $25 an hour, require a bachelor's degree or beyond. Some examples of tier one jobs, nurse, electrician, marketing analyst. So now we know demand is clearly high. Let's talk about price. Next slide. Despite this growing need for education credentials beyond high school, the cost for Colorado residents to obtain a degree at a university or college is only getting more expensive. Tuition and fees have far outpaced inflation and most other consumer items. When you look at the cost of goods and services, higher ed is at the top of the list. Since 2002, tuition and fees for in-state students has grown over 240%. Inflation has grown just over 40%. Even items like housing and medical costs, which we all know have gone up, have not grown nearly as quickly as in-state tuition. Next. Costs have not risen equally across all of Colorado's institutions. Over the last 20 years, University of Colorado Boulder has seen resident tuition and fees increase over 300%, and CSU falling just short of that. What is that in nominal terms? It's roughly $8,500 to $9,100 since 2001. MSU has seen tuition and fees grow by less, but still over 200% or $5,000 in nominal terms, much faster than inflation. So I think the question that everybody on the webinar today should be asking is, why has the cost of higher education for Colorado residents increased so dramatically? Next. Growing tuition and fees for Coloradans reflects two large realities. First, declining share of general fund contributions from our state budget. And second, an overall growth in costs. 
In 2019 alone, there was about a 400 million annual gap in general fund contributions towards student tuition and fees. That is, if the general fund would have kept pace with inflation since 2001. However, tuition and fees related to higher education have outpaced inflation growth. Therefore, we actually need another 416 million that would have been needed for the general fund to have kept pace with student costs. So that's really a total of 800 million that's actually needed. While an overall increase in the price of higher education in Colorado is in line with national trends that we see, expenditures related to things like administrative costs, including increased student support services like advising that improve graduation rates, along with capital improvements have increased significantly for institutions. For example, CU Boulder has seen administrative costs grow by over $2,200 since 2010. CSU Global's actually bucked this trend and their administrative costs have fallen by $800. Next. So we know Colorado's workforce is requiring more and more individuals with post-secondary education. Unfortunately, the cost of receiving a degree is increasingly out of reach. The recession and significant reduction in state budget support will impact every school in our state. The possible decline in enrollment will impact more than others. In the short term, federal funding has helped to cover some of the shortfall, but that's a band-aid. Tough choices are ahead, but these are challenges that can be solved. As I noted earlier, it isn't all bad news out there. Colorado's blessed to be home to world-class institutions. That's our starting point. Students wanna be here, employers wanna recruit here. That's a reality that not even something as bad as COVID can change. With a little innovation on the part of leaders at institutions and in government, with a little collaboration with leaders in industries, we can keep institutions thriving and affordable for students of our great state. I'd like to now turn it over to my good friend, Scott Wasserman. CSI and the Bell might not always see eye to eye on the issues, but our dialogue is vital and Scott's is an important voice in the debate. Scott? Uh, thanks so much, Kristen. I really uh, appreciated this opportunity to collaborate with you and I, I appreciate uh, the Colorado Business Roundtable putting this together. Um, what I'll try to do very quickly is uh, just to provide, I guess in the next three minutes, a little bit more context uh, for some of the costs uh, that Kristen just talked about in the higher education space. And I'll, I'll just add that, you know, while Colorado is certainly a changing place, um, we recently wrapped up a, a study on Colorado's middle class. And while we all look forward to changes in the workforce, there's certainly no question that higher education continues to be a driver of economic mobility. Uh, and that as you look across the economy, getting that degree or certificate is really key to people moving uh, up and through our economic system. So uh, next slide, please. Um, so I just wanna talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the, the uh, cost shift uh, that has come from declining uh, general fund support for higher education. Um, I, I really see higher education in this state as sort of the canary in the coal mine. Unlike a lot of other things in our budget, higher education is, I guess, the least protected from cuts when revenue declines. So what you're seeing here um, is essentially a flip. Uh, back in 2000, in-state tuition um, was, uh, you know, uh, families were expected to cover one third of the cost. And this chart is a little mislabeled. It should talk about the uh, share of costs. Um, and then the state picked up two thirds. And what you can see here really is uh, a good representation of what we've seen in terms of state revenues over time. And I think what's also evident is that uh, the state contribution uh, has really never recovered. And so today, when people talk about that high in-state tuition and how different that was from 20 years ago, this gives you a little bit of a snapshot in terms of the state investment versus what families are expected to pick up. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I think what's notable, though, is that we've never truly recovered. And so while what you can see here is that as our tuition has gone up and you compare us to other states in the country, um, you can see Colorado in that right hand uh, chart um, as paying some of the highest uh, in-state tuition. When you look at total revenue, we still fall behind. Um, 
So I, I think one of the things that this chart really shows is that as in-state tuition has gone up, the state really has lagged behind in terms of uh, recovering its investment from 20 years ago. And so in some ways, we're kind of like a gerbil on a treadmill, even as in-state tuition goes up, um, we still are middle of the pack um, in terms of our actual revenue per student. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, you know, I think there's, there's, there's much to be said and not enough time to talk about the, the model shift that this divestment has really required of our institutions. And I think the best way to look at that is to look a little bit at what out-of-state tuition is uh, and where enrollment is coming from for our institutions. Um, in part, what the divestment uh, in higher education in Colorado has meant is for many institutions, essentially a shift to a uh, high tuition, uh, high, a high need model where, you know, uh, out of state students are paying a higher level of tuition in order to subsidize and cover um, the gap that's been created for, for students here in the state. So, you know, Boulder is a good example of an institution that um, has increased out of state tuition over time in order to make it affordable uh, for uh, in state uh, students to attend. Um, and then, as you can see, even for all of our four year institutions, that out of state enrollment uh, change is, is really quite big. And, you know, while, while we don't have time to talk about all of the cost drivers in higher education, I know our panels will talk about that. Just think about what our institutions in our state need to do to attract those out of state students. Oftentimes it does mean infrastructure changes. It means offering new services, things that will attract those students from the coast uh, to pay those higher prices. Um, next, please. So um, I do want to just talk a little bit about where the state, uh, you know, is in terms of moving away from costs. You know, how do we get to a place where we're increasing uh, credential attainment in the state? So a couple of things. Um, one is we have one of the uh, highest uh, gaps between uh, Latinos and their white peers in the country. We're actually second. Uh, we have the second or the third largest, according to this figure, the third largest gap there. So one of the big goals for higher education is not simply um, how do we deliver the best possible education to every single student, but how do we close some of those gaps? And so the state of Colorado does have a master plan. Uh, the idea is that 66% of, uh, of adult Coloradans will have attained a credential by 2025. Closing that equity gap is really key. And so something to also consider as you're thinking about higher education is if there are students uh, that we are trying to close that gap, what kinds of resources could be wraparound services, things like that are needed. And then that also becomes a, a cost driver as well in terms of closing equity gaps. Um, I'll just move as quickly as I can to the next slide. Um, so some of the strategies, and this is where the Bell does do a lot of work, um, thinking about what are the things that are gonna make our higher education institutions more efficient. While money is certainly really crucial to this puzzle, there's a lot of things that are underway. Um, completion, right? The time to completion, the average completion time is often uh, six years or more. Um, thinking about, you know, concurrent enrollment at the high school level. How can we incentivize people to get credentials and credits before they even get into an institution? Um, what can we do to lower cost? Again, concurrent enrollment is that kind of thing where you can essentially earn credits for free. Of course, the state is picking up the tab, but that's going to help lower the overall cost of credits once they get there. And then really thinking about career pathways. Um, you know, I think that we, we always want people thinking about what is the return on investment on a credential. Um, and so the more we can educate students about where particular credentials lead in the economy and in a career, the better off our students are gonna be. Uh, in my mind, one of the worst things to imagine is going to college, paying your student loan, uh, accru accruing all of that debt and then never actually getting the credential to be able to afford to pay for that debt. And so there's a number of experiments that I'm sure uh, our, our panelists will talk about that are underway to make time to completion more efficient and more effective for students. Um, last slide, please. Um, so, I mean, I, I just in terms of COVID, I mean, a couple things to just quickly say, and then um, I'll, I'll hand it off to our, our convener. Um, there's no question, you know, we have cut 25% from the state budget in this uh, fiscal year. So the pattern of divesting from higher education does continue. And while the CARES Act did provide funding for higher education institutions, 
uh, Congress was very explicit in that those dollars cannot take the place of ongoing funding for institutions. They can really only be used in a one-time manner for, for the acute uh, sort of you know, ripple effects from the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, and I think that's notable from the past. Prior to the, in the Great Recession, Congress actually injected resources into the states and said quite explicitly that you have to use these, uh, these dollars to cover ongoing costs. Um, and I also think that we have to think a little bit about the business model. If we've asked our institutions in this state, for instance, to shift more to an out of state, high, high tuition, high aid model, um, but then students cannot come here to be physically present in the state, what kind of change does that mean say for the business model of our four year institutions here in the state? Um, so I'm out of time, uh, certainly a lot more context to provide. Um, but, you know, I, I did want to give you all a little bit of a context in terms of how public funding and public policy affect the cost drivers for higher education institutions. Thank Great. You. Thank you so much, Scott and Kristen, for helping to set the stage. I mean, obviously, this is a big topic that it's hard to condense all the challenges in a short amount of time. So we want to go ahead and kick it off um, for some introductions for our panelists. And to do that, I want to introduce um, Dave Eddy for the purpose of that introduction. Uh, Dave Eddy has been with the Boeing Company for 30 years and is the Boeing Site Director for Colorado. While Dave's day job is to continue Colorado's thriving aerospace footprint, he is also passionate about educational opportunities, serving as the chair for Colorado Business Roundtable and also serving on the board of Colorado Succeeds. So welcome, Dave. Thank you, Debbie. Appreciate that. So first of all, I'm very grateful to have three presidents that are willing to have a conversation today. I'll thank them in advance and I will get into their bios real quickly. Uh, but first, I wanted to, to say a few words regarding the strategic importance of these higher education um, universities. Um, when we look across the talent pipeline, uh, clearly, the state of Colorado, who is the number one aerospace state in the United States per capita, California is number one, but they've got 26 million people. So we like to think of ourselves as, as the number one state. Um, we really are looking to see these higher institutions uh, continue to produce the kind of talent that allows us to recruit and hire these individuals here in the state of Colorado uh, because most of them want to stay in the state. Um, even the ones that come from outside, uh, once they get to Colorado, it's such a great place to live that they would like to work in Colorado and we understand that. Part of the solution I think is for us uh, along with all the other aerospace companies in the region is to continue our collaboration and working closely with these institutions uh, to ensure that we're identifying the skill sets that we need, whether it's software, whether it's uh, uh, business people, whether it's HR people, because we need the whole uh, gamut of, of talent. It's not just engineers. You know, the uh, median salary for aerospace engineers in the state of Colorado is $133,000 a year, which is two and a half times the median salary for all the other jobs. And so it does provide more than a living wage. And really, uh, as you can see in some of the areas that we've been able to give back, along with Lockheed Martin, Ball, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, you know, all the aerospace primes, um, it is a collaboration and is teamwork. And so we are really looking forward to seeing uh, what's gonna happen going forward, what the new normal is gonna look like. You know, for our business model, we really haven't slowed down. Uh, our classified people have been going into work since day one because you can't do that work from home. And our telecommuters, which now make up 60% of our workforce, we have seen very little if, if any drop in the productivity from these people. And so our engineers are still working hard to satisfy our customers. And again, the talent pipeline will be critical for us to continue that. So let me jump over to the introductions and uh, that way you guys can get the conversation kicked off. So I'll start with uh, Mark Kennedy, the president of the University of Colorado. Uh, president Kennedy oversees a university system with four campuses, 
Boulder, Colorado Springs, Denver, and the Anschutz Medical Campus. That covers more than 60, 67,000 students, 37,000 employees, and has an annual budget of $4.8 billion. Before assuming the presidency of CU, Mr. Kennedy distinguished himself in successful roles in business, government, and higher education. Mr. Kennedy came from CU, from the University, Mr. Kennedy came to CU from the University of North Dakota, where he served as president. Before the University of North Dakota presidency, Mr. Kennedy served as the director of the Graduate School of Political Management at George Washington University. Prior to his roles in higher education, Mr. Kennedy served in the U.S. House of Representative, representing districts in Minnesota, and had a highly successful career in the private sector. We've also recently welcomed President Kennedy to the Board of Colorado Business Roundtable, and I've met Mark virtually. Um, and so again, welcome Mark and looking forward to your comments. Uh, Joyce McConnell, the president of Colorado State University, she is the first woman president in CSU's long history. Joyce is a proud is proud to lead one of our nation's best land grant universities and equally proud to embody the progress that CSU has made in embracing and celebrating the diversity of its campus community. Prior to stepping into this presidency, she spent more than 20 years at another flagship R1 land grant institution, West Virginia University. In addition to being passionately committed to the mission and success of land grant institutions, Joyce is an active advocate for equity in education and the workplace, as well as an advocate for the preservation and protection of our environment. Joyce was named the 2014 Public Servant of the Year by the West Virginia Association for Justice and awarded the Special Places Award by West Virginia Land Trust in 2010. And we look forward to hearing Joyce's comments also. Dr. Janine Davison, now I have actually met Janine. She and I sit on a, uh, a Colorado Prosper board together. And so I've had a chance to talk to her and hear her comments previously. Dr. Davison is the president of MSU of Denver, the state's third largest public university serving more than 19,000 students in a high quality career oriented undergraduate and graduate academic programs. Prior to her appointment in 2017, Janine served as the 32nd Undersecretary of the United States Navy and the President's appointed Chief Management Officer for the Navy and the Marine Corps. Her appointment as Navy Under followed nearly 30 years of academic, civilian, and military service. She has taught at George Mason University, Georgetown University, Davison College, and various professional military schools, and was an aviation and acrobatics flight instructor at the US Air Force Academy. She began her career as an Air Force officer and a cargo pilot. She was a distinguished graduate of the Air Force Squadron Officer School and the first woman to fly the Air Force's tactical C-130. I do have a slight bias here, given that my daughter's a senior at MSU in electrical engineering. So with that, let me turn it back over to Debbie and looking forward for a robust conversation. That's awesome, Dave. Good to, good to have your bias explained. So we'll, we'll see which hat you get to wear later. So finally, uh, the time we've been waited for, we, we're waiting for to hear from the university presidents and want to welcome all of you to the conversation. And we're going to frame this um, in two separate buckets. The first one we're going to start off is talking about challenges. And then we want to spend the remainder of the time talking about opportunities. So um, challenges is probably the biggest one. So we'll jump right in and um, and go from there. So um, let's see. Uh, I, I appreciate Dave's comments as we talk about what we're doing with Colorado Business Roundtable. You know, um, workforce issues are personal for many of us, but higher education is something that's important to all of us. So um, let's see. Here are some additional challenges, and then I'll let all of you have your turn um, addressing these. Uh, as we saw in some of the slides, the state's higher ed budget was cut 58% due to COVID's corresponding economic impacts. Colorado ranks 48th in the nation in terms of state support for higher education. The health concerns with COVID-19 has led to changes in instructional models, 
programming, fall athletics, and staffing. And the higher, um, the economic crisis that corresponds, of course, with the pandemic um, is putting additional significant pressure on higher education budgets. So there has never been a more pressing time for leadership, and you all fall into that uh, role for your institutions. Um, tell us more about yourself and tell us more about the specific challenges that you're facing. And I'm going to go in order. Um, Dr. Davidson, I'd like you to go first, President McConnell, and then President Kennedy. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, I'm assuming you can hear me okay. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks, everybody, for setting this up and your opening comments were great framing for, for what we're going to discuss. Um, I'll just talk really quickly about maybe three or four challenges that I see. First of all, the number one challenge is that this triple crisis, which is COVID plus economics, and even now there's a political unrest. So I'm calling it sort of the triple crisis because it all comes together at universities in so many ways. But really, this, this has really only exacerbated the greatest threat to the future of public higher education that we were already facing before this, which is the chronic disinvestment from the state that both of your, both, both, um, both people already talked about. Um, you know, if you went to college in the 70s or the 80s, uh, a lot of us think, oh, we worked our way through school with that summer job. But you know, the, tr the, the truth is, and many of us didn't even know this, that we had an angel investor called the American people that were paying something like 60 to 80% of the cost, depending on where it was you were going to school. And today in Colorado, especially, that's completely flipped. You've already seen the charts. So that is actually the single biggest reason why, why the cost to students has gone up. Now, I will admit there are other cost drivers. They pale in comparison, but they, they do exist and they're not totally trivial. Um, and I'm sure my colleagues would agree that the amount of money that we spend on things that some in some cases didn't even really exist in the 70s and 80s when many of us went to school, things like mental health, massive outlays on mental health today, um, regulations that we have to keep up with. I mean, I have two lawyers that work in, on my staff. I can't imagine how many Mark must have for the whole system in, a, in a gen the general counsel shop. Um, healthcare costs, just like any other business going up. And then there's this whole thing called the, the web. <laughs> And, and your IT backbone. And that has been a huge issue, again, uh, in this particular uh, crisis, because I, it's one of those ironies that is just happens to just be a fact that people think that in, in um, online education is somehow substandard and should be less expensive. Well, it isn't always a substandard. It can be done well. Um, and it is done well in many cases. That said, it isn't everybody's preference. I get that. But the fact is, it isn't always necessarily cheaper to actually produce. I mean, you don't have, you do still have some brick and mortar where people actually work. You also have faculty members who actually teach the classes. And then there's this whole IT backbone with sort of the parallel of your infrastructure. So those are some of the things that have driven cross. There are some, um, there are some unique things about MSU Denver that I don't think match the narrative that's out there. Actually, they don't match the narrative. This idea that there's administrative bloat. Uh, MSU Denver is the least well-funded institution in the state. Um, we are massively lean. We have a 27 to one student to administrator ratio and the average is something like 10 to one. Uh, so we do way, way more with less and, but there is obviously a breaking point. Our tuition has still been kept um, below about 10K a year. It's, it's less than that. And you know, on your chart where you have, um, where, where we showed the, the rising costs of all of us, um, MSU Denver has raised its tuition in the last 10 and 15 years, but um, I will point out for you math geeks in the audience that a, a large percentage of a small number is still a small number. <laughs> so uh, there, there's that, that's like one of the uniquenesses about MSU. Another challenge, that I think we all have is politics. And um, you know what happens in, in Colorado and in many states is that uh, we have these crises and what, what, come, what happens is, is that the state tends to sort of raid the higher education budget. It's really not protected. I think Scott, Scott talked about that. And sure enough, we had 58% cut to the higher education budget, which is just enormous. It was able to be back filled a little bit this year or mostly this year by federal dollars. But that is the looming, uh, you know, tsunami that's coming at us in next year's budget that we're all working about, we're worried about. And that's particularly challenging for MSU Denver, that whole dynamic, because we actually don't have the levers that other schools have. We don't have that cover and tuition because of the kind of students we serve. 
by law, we are an access institution. We're the only four-year access institution. That means anybody can come here and we help them find their way. And that's one of the reasons I love the place. But 96% of our students are Coloradans. So we have not pivoted into, um, you know, moving into out-of-state, wealthy out-of-state kids to, to, to uh, fund the rest of our um, thing. Because it's, it's not our mission. And actually, we don't have we're more of a commuter school anyway. So, um, but we pride ourselves in the fact that we educate so many Coloradans. They're massively diverse. 46% of our students are students of color. We're an HSI institution. 56% um, of our students are first in their family ever to go to college. I mean, it really is sort of the engine room for the American dream and it's, it's really important. And what this means is that, you know, we, we are really challenged um, because we don't have those other sort of levers when, when the state gets cut. Another thing that I, the third challenge I see is um, sort of related, but it's this another part of the narrative that's out there, and it's about the sort of declining faith in the system of higher education. And you know, I I don't advocate for higher ed because I'm a university president. I'm a university president because I really believe in the power of public higher education. And let's talk about that for a second. You know, it's really you heard already David talk about it. It is. It is what fuels our economy. It is our talent pool. It is our workforce pipeline. And um, what's happening is because we're not investing as a public good in our, in our institutions like other states and countries are, we are starting to lose. So you can talk about just being a little more innovative and just pulling more rabbits out of hats, but you know, we are really innovative. Um, but at the end of the day, it's not, it's not an even playing field if we are, if we, you businesses are competing against states and countries who actually have a better partner in their government who are, in, who are in investing in. And so what I would ask the business leaders on the line is to really help us in that way. We are already partnering with us in terms of apprenticeships and internships and, uh, and things like that and even this kind of dialogue, but we really need you to talk to legislators um, and turn this around that uh, education is a private good for your students, for your kids, that's true, but it's a public good when it comes to the fact that we need to build our workforce and be competitive as a state. Um, and uh, so I, I think the, a little bit of the challenges the way we face the, the, the looming challenge and the last one I'll talk about is what I will call the alligator closest to the boat, which is fall and spring and how we're all coping. Um, we pivoted early and made the decision. So 85% of our classes will be online. We did that so that our faculty could plan and our students could plan and have sort of truth in advertising that we wouldn't pivot on them again. And we just saw the writing on the wall. Um, and then we invested the, a lot of the CARES Act money in that IT infrastructure that I talked about. And that's really, really been helpful and given that time for our faculty to get used to that um, and really deliver some high quality online education. Um, and so we're, we're working on that and we have um, been working with our Auraria partners to put some safety pr protocols in place. I feel pretty confident about um, the, the few classes that we will have in person that they will be safe. I'm a little bit less confident about athletics. <laughs> and I'd love to hear what Mark and Joyce have to say about that one because I think there's still a lot of that being worked out. So um, I, will, I will stop right there and turn it over to my colleagues. So those are the, the big four challenges that, that I see facing us right now. Thank you so much. Uh, now we'll welcome President McConnell. There, I unmuted myself. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, it is really wonderful to be here and I'm really uh, deeply proud of the Colorado Business Roundtable for doing this and for reaching out to higher education. I do uh, believe very deeply in the partnership between higher education and business. And um, I think um, Dr. Davidson has done a wonderful job of laying out many of the challenges we face. I do wanna really, um, I wanna talk about the shift over the last 50 years from higher education being a public good to it being a private good. Um, and I also want to talk about the uh, way in which this not only impacts the students and puts a burden on the families in terms of what they're paying in tuition and costs. I also want to talk a bit about the pulling back, not just from state government, but federal government in terms of its investment in higher education. And then I want to talk about the fact that um, Colorado's land grant university 
actually has a triple mission, which is education, research, and engagement. Um, and I wanna talk a bit about that because the decline in revenue from the state not only impacts the tuition of our students, but it also impacts our ability to be able to deliver the services to the state that are expected from a land grant university. Um, and that's particularly important, I think, during this COVID-19 um, challenge that we're struggling with. And then finally, I also wanna talk about all of the new ways in which we invest in our students so that we're opening our doors to more and more students, not just to be accessible, but to be successful. And the way that that's also driven up costs in a way that we're proud of. Um, and so it deserves a, a greater explanation. And finally, I wanna talk about the, the business of higher education and its contribution to the economy. Um, so, uh, and let me start with the last point. Um, the Northern Colorado schools got together and did a study, um, hired an independent consultant to do a study on, of the economic impact of higher education in Northern Colorado. We found a, out among the community colleges and the four-year schools that we're actually annually contributing $3.9 billion to the Northern Colorado economy. And why do I think that's so important? I think it's important because as the business community rec recognizes, we are a business. And just like um, uh, David Eddy said that we they were operating from the moment that COVID hit the United States, our institutions of higher education have also continued to operate and have made a really deep commitment to trying to retain not only our students and to educate them the best we possibly can, but retain our employees so that we're not damaging the economy further uh, than COVID-19 is. And so David made a great point of talking about all of the people who are working so hard in industry, and that is true in higher ed too. Um, and I think we've, the, the schools in Colorado have taken their economic role very, very seriously. And I think that's important for me to share um, with the business community. And of course, that's been very critical uh, to county and city economies. And so um, moving to my next topic, which is why are we spending more money on education now? Why have we seen costs go up? And Dr. Davidson did, did such a great job of talking about that. And I wanna narrow it down a little bit because I know every president on this call feels deeply about this, is that a lot of the money that's being invested in higher education is because we want to remain as accessible as possible. And not only do we wanna remain accessible to the largest number of people, particularly our Coloradoans, but we also want our students to be successful. And we know that not all of our students are coming from an even playing field. And our job to, to help students become successful and be able to enter the workforce with the credentials they need is to provide them the support that they need over the four years to actually graduate within four years, to graduate with the least debt possible, to graduate feeling empowered to enter the workforce. And those are th all of those things, whether it's advising or additional academic support or mental health interventions, the use of technology to support different kinds of accommodation for different learners, all of that have, have escalated the cost overall of higher education. But it's not just because we wanna trim the Christmas tree in higher education. It's because we're really doing it with a sense of purpose um, for our students really feeling compelled to lift them up um, into the workforce. And so it's so important, I think, that we talk about that and talk about all of the efforts that are being made um, at both community colleges and our four-year colleges. And then I wanna talk about what it means to be a land-grant university because not everyone understands that. And I'm not gonna go back to talk about its roots, but rather talk about what its mission is currently. And that is we, the land-grant institution is charged with being accessible, 
to, to Coloradoans and 70% of our students are from Colorado and 30% of our students are first generation students from Colorado. We also have a commitment and a responsibility to the state around what we refer to as engagement and also extension. So we actually have employees in all, in 63 of the 64 counties and serve all 64 counties in Colorado with services, whether those services are 4-H youth um, education, uh, adult education in critical areas like food and nutrition, or community development directly delivered within communities through our engagement offices. And that's really important for the citizens of Colorado to understand that our mission is not just education within the campus, but it's education throughout the state of Colorado delivered for free to residents of Colorado through engagement and extension. And finally, we have an enormous research obligation and research enterprise. And the research that we do, we want directly to be in service of Colorado. And so, and I know you'll hear um, Mark Kennedy discuss this. Your research universities in Colorado have been working double time trying to produce the kind of research and, and application necessary to be able to test for COVID, to be able to deliver therapeutics for COVID, to understand the transmission of disease from animals to humans and be able to stop that transmission. And so the research that's going on around COVID, but all of our state and global challenges on your research campuses really matter to the state and matter hugely to the economy of the state. Um, and so I wanted to lay that perspective because we tend um, to think about education as merely having an education responsibility. But for our universities, our responsibilities are enormous. And we take those responsibilities very seriously. And as the state continues to consider education a private rather than a public good, being able to deliver on those multiple responsibilities gets harder and harder and more challenging. And we don't want to continue shifting the burden to our students and their families. And I'm gonna stop there and then um, we'll be able to move on. But I wanna thank Dr. Davidson and everyone who set the stage. This is really powerful. Thank you so much. and. Uh... Appreciate those comments, President McConnell. Now we'll turn it over to President Kennedy for some opening remarks. Well, I, I too want to thank the Colorado Business Roundtable for having this forum. I, it's always great to be with Joyce and Janine and our colleagues. And you should know that the higher education institutions in the state work very closely together. And uh, we're trying our best to deliver the best we can for the state. When you think about the challenges we're facing, if you think about CU or universities, our number one challenge is return to campus this fall. Uh, that's important for the workforce that we're training for the future. It's important since we're all big employers ourselves. Clearly our health and safety of our faculty, staff and students is our number one concern. Uh, but we also wanna deliver on our mission of continuing to advance people towards their educational goals to, to get the talent you need and for them to have the careers that they wanna have. And this is required a lot of hard work on all of our faculty and staff and, and a lot of investments to, to make sure that we're having safe campuses. So, so know that's our number one challenge that's top of mind and, and we're focused on. The number two challenge is the increased civil rights concerns that we take very seriously. And uh, for us to really deliver the opportunity that, that every individual in the state deserves, we need to be increasingly good at attracting, retaining, and graduating those from, from all backgrounds. And frankly, for you as employers to have the workforce you need, uh, we're moving to a majority minority state. And so if we aren't really making sure that the opportunity of a college degree is available to all, we're not gonna really have the talent that the state needs. So we're taking a lot of action steps forward on that. And, and it's again, an important priority for us. The other thing is, uh, as somebody whose doctors uh, 
on our staff, on our faculty are, are taking a disproportionate share of the pandemic cases through the University of Colorado Hospital are working on, on how we can get through this pandemic and solve it. Uh, that's clearly a key priority. And besides uh, teaching remotely, uh, our faculty doctors have gone from just a handful of non, uh, non -psych psychiatric uh, remote sessions to thousands per day in, in the span uh, of less than a week. So they've pivoted, they've adjusted, they've worked hard to provide the care that the state increasingly needs in a pandemic. And the fourth thing that I think is challenging, Janine mentioned the IT and, and online, but students, learners are changing the way they wanna consume higher education uh, because it's being offered in, in many different forms. They're getting to understand it. We're getting better at all those forms. Uh, and it will also change the degrees they want. We're here remotely. The degree of technological advances that are happening during this pandemic are accelerating what was already a fast pace. So we need to change and adapt and prepare for more technical degrees moving forward and uh, be prepared to deliver the kind of education in the way people want. But a bigger concern is the challenges we face as a state. And I don't want you to get the message that woe is us higher education is woe is we, the state of Colorado, because we are taking a big risk as a state a big risk because those states with the most college degrees win. Even those that don't have a college degree make more money, the greater the percentage of college graduates there are in the state. But we are, we are betting on two things, on out-of-state tuition to subsidize the excellence that you see at our universities, just to put a, a, to the point, uh, every in-state student at the University of Colorado Boulder gets subsidized by $7,000 a year by the net effect of out-of-state students. And are those out-of-state students gonna continue to come given that we're having a shrinking of the pool of people pursuing college and other states are gonna keep theirs, given that the cost of real estate has gone up here in the state, that's a high risk that you can't count on lasting forever. Given that online is sort of chipping away at, um, at uh, out-of-state premiums. The other thing is, as was mentioned earlier by, I think, Kristen, that we're importing other states' graduates. We're counting on other states to educate their college graduates and import it here. Again, real estate costs makes that a uh, concern. College degrees are gonna be needed for future jobs. Uh, Kristen mentioned that all of the tier one uh, uh, jobs require college a bachelor's or above. But McKinsey suggests that it's only those that are college and above that are going to be growing. Anything less is going to be shrinking. And, and that should be a concern when, when less people are pursuing four-year degrees. The earning gap is getting uh, continuing to get bigger, according to many projections. The return is very high. Can we make it better? Yes. You know, Scott mentioned career advice. We have a lot of people taking concurrent enrollment but they still end up spending 120 credits to get a degree because they don't know what to do. Uh, Scott also mentioned uh, diversity and the, and the equity gap, the achievement gap. A big part about that is in a state that treats it as a private good, we need to have the investments as Kristen said in the advising and it's hard to do that where, where we're at. David Eddy mentioned the technical degrees. It costs us almost twice as much to educate an, an engineer as opposed to somebody in the social sciences and teaching engineering on five uh, places in the state. Uh, when you have it as a private good, there is less of an incentive for students because they're having to pay more to get that degree. And when we look at, at what do we get from the state in funding and the state in in-state tuition, only Montana receives less total state funding in-state tuition than Boulder. And, and they're ranked 254, Boulder's 100, uh, and they're not giving the billion dollars plus in research that we're delivering uh, in, in space and, and healthcare and, and so many other things. So I, I would just implore uh, everybody on the call to understand that your future, the economic opportunities your kids are gonna face, the opportunities that we face in the state uh, depend on us treating higher education as a public good, not a private good. 
Thank you, President Kennedy. Um, just for the folks watching today, we're running a little bit long. I'm not sure that we'll get to the Q&A from the attendees, but if you do leave a question in there, I'm happy to get that answer for you from one of the university presidents or to get that data from you from the Bell Policy Center or uh, Common Sense Institute. So know that, um, put your email in there, we'll make sure we get you a response if we're not able to do it on the, on the um, time we have today. Uh, so it's interesting listening to all these challenges. It makes me think all the private sector folks uh, in whatever capacity they're in, whether they're CEOs or likewise, uh, you know, are probably looking at your jobs and not wanting to fight you for your job right now. You've got big jobs with all the challenges. But I wanna turn it quickly to opportunities. In a time of disruption, I think we're seeing every industry tackle disruption in a new way you know what how do we utilize technology in a new way how do we um you know think about telehealth you know there's so many positives that can come out of perhaps a disruptive time like we're having now and so i'm just curious how are you what are you doing and you, you might have addressed some of these in your in your original remarks but what are you doing um to innovate collaborate collaborate and execute maybe in a new way, looking ahead to 2020 and kind of what, um, how to meet all the needs of your stakeholders, whether it's students or staff or educators or the stakeholders and taxpayers who pitch in, um, as I think the consensus is not enough to the higher ed, but, but how are you innovating for the future? And um, I think we'll shake it up a little bit. Why don't we go in reverse order, um, President Kennedy um, and then President McConnell and Dr. Davidson. And if I could on this one, we're running a little short on time, you know, maybe two, three minutes is kind of your kind of your future forward look. I, I would say, number one, uh, we are hyper focused on diversity, equity and inclusion. We are taking a lot of action. And I think that you will see meaningful change out of CU and of all our campuses. Number two, everybody's having to be more adaptable and resilient. And the innovation has never been at a higher pace in higher education. And I think you're gonna be seeing dividends for that being paid in the future. And number three, uh, research. Uh, we spent a lot of time on research. We have a new saliva test that we hope gets validated by the state soon, which will, I think, be a, a big breakthrough. Uh, we've been advancing a lot of the therapeutics and, and the vaccines. Uh, we're, we're doing things in healthcare that I truly do believe will help lower the cost of healthcare in the future. So just know that that we are innovating, we are adapting, and, and our students having to adapt will make them stronger for the future uh, because that's what our, our future will hold for us. So I'll do that with a very short summary, but we're bullish a long-term on CU and on what higher education can deliver for a state. Thank you, President McConnell. Um, I always say that you can never squander a crisis that you've got to jump in there and figure out how to learn from it and take advantage of it. And I think everyone in higher education is doing that. Um, I do agree with President Kennedy that one of the things that is top of mind for all of us are issues of equity, inclusion, and justice. And with the shift in the demographics in the state of Colorado, we have, have to really period of time to look at what it is we're doing to serve students, how to attract a greater number of students into the university, and how to get them six, through four years with a degree and into the workforce contributing to Colorado. Um, that's first and foremost. I, I think the equity issues are really um, extraordinarily important right now. I also agree on the research side, the major research universities in the state are really global leaders in terms of the kind of research that's going on, whether it's vaccines um, and uh, even sanitation techniques, engineering, um, all of the disciplines have really poured in and tried to say, how do we use our expertise to get through this crisis? What kind of research and applied research can we do that will make a difference most quickly? And so that's really, if you want to look at the opportunity, this opportunity has really catalyzed innovation on the research side and the rapidity with which research is done. And I think that that's really extraordinarily important. And finally, I think that one of the opportunities this has given us is to say, 
we're going to have to have a new business model. What's the business model going to be? Um, because the one that we, we use to adapt to the crisis in 2008 may not be the business model that allows us to adapt now, particularly if the economic downturn lasts a, uh, quite a long time. Um, and so thinking about how to shift the, the economic model, um, working with the state to do that, I, one of the things that um, Mark Kennedy said that I think is so very important for people to realize is as proud as we are about Colorado, we're at risk the entire state, if we don't start making wiser investments um, in education. And I, Mark put it so well, it's not woe is us in higher education. We really fear for the state and fear for its residents. And we wanna play a role and this is an opportunity to really to sound that alarm and then pull everyone in to work together to really make Colorado as great as we know it is. Great, Dr. Davidson. Thank you, thanks. Um, Debbie, thanks for the shout out for how hard our jobs are. <laughs> I am reminded of my colleague, my former Pentagon colleague, Admiral Bill Craven, who was the head of all like Navy SEALs and special operations. And then he went to go be a college president. And when he retired, he said it was the hardest job in the world. And I thought compared to what he did before, that's a pretty big statement. But then he also said that it's the most rewarding, which it is. Yeah, so I think fighter yeah. pilot sounds kind of hard too. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, anyway, um, yes, it's a hard job, but um, yes, we are innovating. We're always innovating. We're always assessing um, this particular crisis. Just what Joyce said, don't let a crisis go to waste. But we, we immediately set up what I call the futures team to sort of pause our strategic planning process and say, are we all the assumptions that we made, you know, six months ago, what are they going to be like 18 months from now? And that nobody has a crystal ball, but there are some trends and um, there's an art to this looking into the future and making and placing some bets. So we're doing exactly uh, what Mark was talking about. And we're thinking about what will students of the future really care about? And we're already seeing that. Um, how will they want to uh, consume online education? Or I think there will be some I think we're going to see a separation. I think some people are going to really want that traditional, you know, cloistered um, elite, um, you know, experience, but that will not be something that will either be realistic or preferable for so many others. And we will be there for them. Stackable um, credentials and certificates, online options, flexible pathways, meeting students where they are instead of trying to cram them into this ridiculous four-year model that doesn't work for the vast majority of working students. Some of those things we were already thinking about before. And then of course, making the experience something that um, uh, real students can uh, feel welcome with diversity, equity, and inclusion issues that are, will be even more important than they already were at MSU Denver. Um, this builds on traditions of innovation at our university. You know, we've already thinking about our public-private partnership that we had with, um, with our, we have a hotel on campus that we own, but is partnered and our students kind of work there. And um, some of the proceeds go to scholarships and to help the program. We'd like to do a lot more of those sorts of things with businesses. Um, we're really looking at the industries that will be affected and what that means for higher education. So whether it's healthcare, advanced manufacturing, um, cyber, things that, you know, what's going to change with the supply chain? Um, and what does that mean for what we need to be delivering for our students? Um, we really consolidated our health programs. We're not a medical school, but for every physician, there are 16 other professions. So we are the school for those 16 other professions in an integrated way. Um, and that is also more important than ever. We also um, will be accelerating our, our C2 hub uh, program, which is a classroom to career hub, really designed to sort of be on what for externally facing one-stop shopping for, for you all, business leaders, partners, industry partners. Um, we're just launching a team of industry navigators that will be sort of like concierges to help industry leaders sort of, you know, I have so many business leaders come to me and say, well, I, you know, where do, how do I do an internship program? You know, we want to help you. We want to figure out what can be a win-win for both sides. Um, and I think that that's really, really important. And so um, in that, you know, the ways that you can contribute to that innovation is by partnering with us, by giving your, by innovating on your side as well, giving your, your employees flexible schedules and tuition assistance, um, making philanthropic donations, of course, 
um, and working with us to sort of craft, you know, 21st century models like what we do with um, Lockheed Martin, uh, where we have a co-op program. Our students take a, a lower course load their last couple semesters, and they're working 20 hours a week on site on real stuff. They're not just, you know, making coffee. They're helping, you know, build spaceships, you know, it's pretty awesome. Um, and the Lockheed has been a great partner. They've hired like 80% of those students out of that program. And I think that that is something that the C2 Hub was designed to scale across other types of industries. Um, and then I'll just finish out with something that Joyce was saying, and that is this, well, and Mark too, this public-private good issue. Let me give you some numbers so you're armed for your conversations. Um, you know, our investment in the state is upside down. And it's not just the state, it's lots of places. Um, you know, if you get a college degree, sure, it is better for you and your earnings, but it is also better for society. You're going to pay into taxes, into the tax base. You're not going to be taking out of it something like um, you'll be 200 to 300% more likely to volunteer and to vote. You'll be a better member of society. And you're, you know, 490%, according to the Lumina Foundation, less likely to go to jail. And I always say that's not trivial, okay, because we spend 10 times more per prisoner than we do per student in the state of Colorado. So let's talk about an upside down investment and let's turn that around together. Thanks. Thank you, um, Dr. Davidson and President Kennedy and um, President McConnell for your comments today. Um, we are going to just handle, if you've put in a question on the um, chat feature, we're gonna handle that separately and apologize that we ran out of time. Um, thank you to Kristen Strom and to Scott Wasserman for helping to set the stage. Um, a couple things that I have takeaways as I, as I see lots of folks on the webinar from the private sector, um, the concept of the public good versus private good. I think that's something we need to know more about. I think the issue of importing talent is something that is um, probably very um, much on the minds of folks who do the hiring here in Colorado, it's probably nothing new and they might wanna get engaged on how do we grow more talent uh, here in Colorado. And also um, wanna really thank uh, these leaders for their leadership. I suspect uh, rather than flying a fighter jet, this is a lot more complicated. There's a lot more parts to running um, a higher ed institution and all the challenges that you all face um, and opportunities right now. But one of the things we say, just to kind of sum it up, it struck me um, with the Colorado Business Roundtable, one of the reasons that we're so passionate about business in Colorado is it's actually not really about business, it's actually about people. And I would say that's probably the one takeaway I got the most from all of you is it's not actually about uh, your institutions, your brick and mortar, um, you know, the budgets, it's actually about the people that you're serving, not only your staff, but the lives that you're changing through the education system. And I can attest to that myself. Um, my mother received her college degree before she had an indoor toilet in her home. In fact, her brother received his college degree before they had an indoor toilet. So education really changed the trajectory of my life through what my parents were able to do in, in securing that higher education that just changed their lives. So for me personally, I'm very passionate about higher education. I wanna do what we can as partners with Colorado Business Roundtable to come alongside you with our businesses and our support to know that we wanna do whatever we can to continue conversations like this, particularly in terms of funding and the support that you need to help change people's lives for the better. So uh, with that, if, either, if anybody wants to, if any of the presidents wanna say one final remark, we'll kind of close up. I'm sorry that the time went so quickly. Um, but we'll kind of go back in reverse order, Dr. Davidson and then President McConnell and President Kenny. Any, any final words of wisdom for us today? Sure, I, I will say, I'll say one thing. Um, we, we're talking about this partnership. That's what's so great about the Colorado Business Roundtable um, being part of this and bringing in some of the business leaders because they do always ask me, you know, what can we do to help? And I, I laid out a couple things. And so I want to leave with that, you know, flexible schedule, working with your students, working with the with the universities, those are some of the obvious things, but I think this issue of a public good versus a private good is a very important thing. And um, I think that, you know, the business leaders talking to legislators and saying, listen, the state of Colorado is the weak leg in this stool that we have that holds up our economy and our society. You know, the higher ed is doing everything it can, the business community is doing everything it can, but we're not 
playing fair against our competitors unless we get the government as part of that partnership, the society as part of that partnership. And, and it, this is not a socialist thing. This is about competition. And that's why the business leaders are the ones that have to be the advocates because um, you know we're, we're we're gonna do it all we can, and it's in it. And whether I say it's not, you know, I'm not doing it just because I'm a college president. I'm a college president because I believe that this is important for our society. Great, thank you. I think this will be the first of many conversations that we all have with the business community and how we can loop in legislators, perhaps, in the next conversation. Uh, president McConnell, any final remarks? Well, I think that we are really that this opportunity is really phenomenal for the institutions of higher education and the business community, because it is the, the time where we can really join together and we can not just talk to one another, but talk to our legislators and our governors and our representatives in Congress, our senators, and make sure that we've got everyone speaking the same voice, which is that we highly value higher education in Colorado, and that we are gonna to work together to move ourselves into a position that is a competitive position, not just because we wanna feed higher education itself, but because we want to have Colorado be the best it can be. It, we want the best community, we want the best educated workforce, we want the best society, we want the best citizen participation, and we want the strongest businesses, the strongest research, the strongest medical care. And all of that depends on the health of our universities and the shift from a private good to a public good. Thank you. President Kennedy, for the last word. I'll just say that uh, the, world is, the world is going more digital, and that means that uh, online is going to get bigger and better. And we need to be good at not, it will be having a little less of a distinction between on campus and online. It's really delivering both to the same people in the right mix that they want it, that we are gonna get better at as part of the innovation you're seeing going on. But also that digital means the workforce we need is gonna be more technical. We need to be delivering more engineers, more technical uh, professionals. And in order for us to do that, we need to have greater partnerships as the number one publicly funded NASA University, we want to partner even more strongly with our aerospace industry. As the number one medical center in the region, we want to partner more strongly to deliver that. But we should talk as a business community, as academia, to talk about what can we do to make sure that those higher cost degrees are being delivered in this state uh, with the funding we have or with new funding that we can do. And I look forward to a, a richer, deeper conversation with the business community, along with my colleagues from higher education in the weeks, months, and years ahead. Perfect. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, again, uh, appreciate your ability to take a deep breath and uh, look at some of these challenges to, to solve and reach out to us as part of the business community to be partners with you. And then also looking ahead at times of opportunities. So I look forward to further conversations. And I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. This has been a program brought to you by Colorado Business Roundtable and proud to have partnered with Common Sense Institute and the Bell Policy Center as well. So thanks everyone for joining.